Let me lay out, lay out my case here. And uh, the big picture, of course, is how, how are we going to try to reconcile these two wildly different theories, general relativity and quantum theory. When one is in space time, and other space time, and the other, the other is in uh, perhaps some crazy configuration space or, or field functions. And I think our intuition on this is that, well, at least quantum theory is the stuff about the small stuff. And so maybe our intuition tells us the small stuff should be more fundamental. And uh, the big stuff, GR, is probably just some uh, emergent uh, story. And underneath it all is some more fundamental story of quantum gravity that, that we're all interested in looking for. And often we're using uh, what we think is our fundamental story here, our quantum theory as a guide to making, finding some underlying story. Uh, if this is right, uh, you tend to get pushed toward Hamiltonian GR, right, because of the structure of quantum theory the way you're looking for unitary evolution, the way you're, you kind of want these foliations. Uh, not necessarily, but I think you get pushed in that direction. Um, and of course you get pushed in the direction of space-time itself as being emergent, because you're starting, you're starting from this kind of what we take to be this fundamental theory, where it's not, it's not about things in space-time. And so the, if you use that as a guide, you end up with something that, that's not in space-time either. Now, um, Alyssa mentioned this, this neutrality principle, that if we're trying to look for a fundamental theory, we should try to step back and not, not presume it's going to work in any particular way. So you might say, well, it's equally, an equal number of people might be working on the, the opposite approach. And this is not, not true at all. But uh, you might say, well, what does size have to do with it? If you're not in space time, then size is, is kind of irrelevant anyway. And you might say, well, there's this whole line of thought that Einstein very, very clearly took that the quantum state is not a state of reality. It's a state of knowledge. It's, it's the one that's a theory. It's the one that's a theory. And uh, you could flip the whole logic around on its head and say, well, maybe there's some deeper, more fundamental, fundamental explanation that quantum states, these states of uh, knowledge, and that's actually in classical physics, that's where configuration space comes from, right? Uh, we have system mechanics, and then underneath it all, we have classical particles, and you just restrict your knowledge on them, and then configuration spaces become very useful in classical physics. Maybe people argue in the cyanocentric perspective that the same thing is true for quantum states. And then, if this is the way forward, presumably we should take our fundamental theory of GR and use it as a guide to find our deeper explanation for, um, for, for quantum theory. Now, um, if this works, uh, there's really no reason why you wouldn't look for something in space-time. Because now you're starting from something that's in space-time. And now maybe you could get basically this link between quantum theory and gravity that maybe you shouldn't call quantum gravity, I don't know what exactly you would call it, space-time to quanta or something like that. But, but some underlying story that fits in space-time and yet still does the basic job of bringing these two stories together. Now, <clears throat> of course, you know, Einstein's uh, perspective on this is not widely held, and the reason why people aren't going down this road is uh, basically Bell's theorem and other no invariant theorems of the sort. That efforts to get a story in space-time seem doomed to failure, um, and uh, basically people ideally would like something living in space-time to explain. Uh, just forget quantum field theory, just quantum mechanics, just entangled states in quantum mechanics, and forget GR, we just, just start with something simpler, special relativity, and just worry about Bell's carefully defined local causality, which I'll talk about one piece of in a minute. And uh, these no-go theorems say, look, it can't be. But, actually this is kind of a weird place to give up, because it's not like you would give up to uh, quantizing gravity in the standard way, by just applying non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Uh, you would use the whole toolbox at your disposal to try to make sense of quantum gravity. And people aren't using the whole toolbox here. Uh, they're not using GR. And uh, they're not looking to necessarily uh, the Grange GR, which I'm going to argue has insights that maybe that X is as apparent as, uh, as people think. And the key starting point here is say, well, what are the assumptions that go into these no-go theorems that tell you you can't do this? And the key assumption that all of them assume is that any hidden variables you have in your system that live in space-time have to be independent of the experimental geometry that they're eventually going to be measured by. The polarizer settings, the Stern-Gerlach, 
angles, the, the question of what measurement we made on in the first place is called statistical independence. And it's just kind of this no-brainer assumption that, of course, we can't violate statistical independence, that any hidden variables have to be blind to any future measurement settings, just as I don't know the future measurement settings until I set them, uh, these particles shouldn't know them either. So that's, that's kind of where things stop. Uh, but I'm going to try to extend this to GR and just point out that this statistical independence doesn't hold in GR. Uh, let's take a, a closed time like curve. If, if you accept that there's plausible uh, geometries in space-time where you have, like, for example, this spinning massive cylinder and the frame dragging around it drags all the light cones around it, and it's just theoretically possible to have a closed time-like curve, uh, all of a sudden we have a, at least one very weird counterexample to this obvious premise that hidden variables can't depend on the future geometry. I mean, the hidden variables on this closed time-like curve not only depend on the fact that this thing keeps spinning in the future, but uh, they depend on what's on the curve in the future of the curve, right? It basically, it's one big self-consistent solution to Einstein's equation, and there are a bunch of examples. Whether or not these are forbidden by some principle, it's unclear, but they're, they're in the map. <clears throat> now, I am not going to suggest that every time we had run an entanglement experiment, there's a closed time-like curve that is explaining all, all of these uh, phenomena. But this should at least make a pause and say, wait a second. It was just so obvious that this wasn't even possible. It's not even on the radar that we should even consider the hidden variables depending on what happens next. And yet, here's an example where this comes out of the map. How could this come out of the map? And so you take a step back and you say the reason this comes out of the map is that this is an all-at-once solution. This is not, you don't get solutions like this in Hamiltonian GR, right? Where you need a foliation. You have to go to it all at once solve all the space-time all at once to get these close time curves and, and basically pull on Lagrangian GR. And so this might tell us, well, maybe there's something neat about this Lagrangian perspective that's going to make, uh, let us violate statistical independence more generally than just in these crazy scenarios. So let's uh, take a look at action principles. Um, it's a very different way to do physics, a very different way to do quantum physics. Uh, I mean, these, just look at these two cartoons of a particle going from one point to another. You get wildly different intermediate pictures depending on whether you take it to be unitarily evolving and then collapsing or something like that, or if you're actually looking at the space of all paths that go to possibly some, some future boundary condition. And that's that's a key. Even classically, you don't get action principles to work if you don't put some future boundary condition locally on, on the system, and then you extremize holding that boundary fixed. This is just this is both classical and quantum, you, you have to do this. Uh, of course, you have to solve it all at once, as I mentioned. And the nice thing about these histories is there's no need to fully in them. Just, you look at the whole history all at once. You don't have to go into a Hamiltonian formalism. You can. Usually what you do is you say, OK, this is all just a new mathematical trick. And you generate the dynamical equations. And then you drop back to the ordinary way of thinking about things that seems more intuitive to us. Initial state, check, check differential equations, uh, probabilities spill out. Um, but we're looking for uh, a way to rescue space-time. We're, we're having trouble with it. So let's, let's push a little harder and say, well, what if these future bounding conditions actually correspond to literal constraint on the system? Not just a mathematical trick, but something, something a little bit deeper. Uh, and then say, is that going to do the trick? And actually it does. And you'll, we'll see. Just putting a final bounding condition on the system immediately violates statistical independence in exactly the right way we need to, to rescue space time. So um, the key uh, last piece of the puzzle to sort of guide, guide where I'm going here is, is time symmetry. Um, this is a, or CPT symmetry, if you want to be uh, careful about it. But uh, this is really important fact we've discovered about the universe, and it's very counterintuitive. And uh, physicists play, pay a lot of lip service to time symmetry. It's really, really important symmetry, really important principle, until we get down to measurements. And uh, obviously, there is this asymmetry uh, in measurements. But at least formally, before you put the agents in, uh, on a space-time diagram, a preparation and a measurement are basically the time reverse of each other. Um, we, there is a difference. And there's a difference that comes in through us in that we can't control the outcome of an experiment, outcome of a measurement. We can't control the input to a, um, uh, to a preparation. 
But that aside, that's, I mean, that, that's obvious where that comes in. That's an asymmetry that comes in from us. Uh, the fundamental physics, especially when you get down to quantum phenomena, are amazingly time symmetric. Um, and it's, it's almost a no-brainer that if you make some preparation, you make some choice of setting, uh, any future viable, any things that exist in the future of that preparation, uh, it's reasonable to just ignore everything that comes before and just treat that as a boundary condition on everything that comes next. That, that just seems odd as we do this all the time in both classical and quantum physics. <clears throat> what seems very counterintuitive to us is when we make a measurement, to put in some setting, uh, to actually have that be a final boundary condition. If, but if you're really going to do more than pay lip service to time symmetry and actually really say, well, this really is effectively a boundary condition on that, um, as weird as this sounds to us, maybe when we're doing a measurement, we're not just finding out what's in the past vehicles, but actually somehow imposing that very boundary condition that we see in these action principles on the past vehicles. And that, if we just add this one little idea, is going to be enough to save space. It's going to be enough to, to not only naturally violate statistical independence, where basically our choice of measurement that comes from outside the system is basically constraining these past vehicles. Um, but as we'll see, it's going to let us explain entanglement. Uh, now, of course, of course, I'm a black universe guy here. It's all there, and we're solving it all at once after all. This is the story. You can't change the past. It's there in the past. So it's safest to analyze it all at once rather than try to find some dynamic story going forward and backward. It's safest, just like in, in close time like curves, you have to analyze these systems all at once. So we're looking at, we're looking at histories. We're, looking at, we're not looking at microscopic states. We're looking at full histories and analyzing. Okay, so this, this is the weird thing. This is weird. This is basically retrocausal. Uh, when you make a measurement, you're constraining the past. But uh, it's, I'll argue, it's not, it's not as weird as, as you might think. Okay, um, let's leave the causality out of for now and just ask, how do you constrain a system, a quantum system in particular, with two time boundary conditions? And even if the Schrodinger equation were on the table, which is not, because it's not in space-time, uh, you can't just put two boundaries on. Uh, that would be an over -constraint. The initial boundary is all you need for a first order differential equation, like the Turing equation. So you got various options here. You can go uh, you here a Harnoff's route and have two sets of dynamic equations, where he has uh, in this two-vector or two-state vector formalism on mechanics. Uh, he basically has these two wave functions, one evolving forward and one evolving backward, as, as they say. Um, but uh, by the time they get into multi-particle states, they're they're out of space. So that, that doesn't seem, uh, and for other reasons, I'm, I'm not going down this road. Another interesting idea is just take a second order differential equation that we normally hack out the solutions to, like the fine Gordon equation, and just treat, take the whole thing at face value and impose two boundary conditions. Um, here, I've run into various problems. I made some progress uh, in this uh, old paper, but um, I've sort of given up on this approach, and I've brought back to before we even get to that, so I've dropped back, I've dropped back to the ground themselves. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that uh, if you take uh, the action quantum action principle seriously, you don't really extremize the action. It's just an approximation when you send Planck's constant to zero. Um, and the nice thing about the path integral is you have all these weird intermediate histories. And it turns out those are going to be exactly what we need because that is going to give us this possibility space of going between two boundaries. Not just going to be one solution, there are going to be lots of solutions. And you might hope that probabilities might emerge from the possibility space of all the different ways to get from the preparation to the measurement. And that's exactly what we're going to see for uh, this example of, of quantum entanglement. So th this is the story I'm going to be pursuing here. The way to do a two-time boundary problem is not to find a differential equation and put two time boundaries on it, but to find an action, constrain it at two points, and look at stuff that goes under it. And I'll spell, spare you the gory details. Um, and the best way to do that turns out to be with this beautiful example by Larry Shulman. Um, I don't know if you know who Larry Shulman is. He wrote a, one of the key books on path integrals. He was one of the key people who developed path integrals for spin. And uh, he also just dabbled in foundations and has come up with this fully time symmetric story for a single particle. Uh, and basically it goes like this. The idea is that every spin one half particle really has some spin vector, really pointing in some direction. And every time you measure it, uh, 
it's going to, it's a boundary condition. If you measure it on the, on the z-axis, that constrains it. It's going to be up or down on the z-axis. It's going to be, that's a boundary condition. And if you measure it again on the 45 degree axis, that's a boundary condition too. Now, how is it going to get from a measurement, say, on one axis at one time to a measurement on another axis at another time? Well, he allows all sorts of weird intermediate things, just like you see in the path angle. And he says, maybe there's just some weird, anomalous, inexplicable rotation by some angle beta. <clears throat> and maybe, he just said, it would be nice if it obeyed this equation. I'll show you why, why that would be nice. Now, gamma is a very tiny parameter. So this is like some Lorenzian distribution of probabilities. And basically, he said, OK, there's lots of ways that you just might have some weird, anomalous rotation to get from this state to this state. But what matters is the net angle. So in this case, 0.4 pi would be uh, beta. You plug that in here. You plug some tiny number. I'll talk about it for gamma. And out comes something. You say, well, that doesn't look like the Born rule. Well, let's see where the Born rule comes in. So he says, OK, now I'm going to measure it on this axis. I can't guarantee the red outcome. I might get the green outcome. The green outcome could happen if it rotated 0.6 pi in the other direction. I can get the green outcome. So you plug that into the equation for that outcome. And he said, oh wait, there's another way I could get the right outcome. I could go one, once around and back again. So you, you plot out all the possibilities, and you say, how can I get the red outcome, and how can I get the green outcome, and you plug them into that equation. And you just add them all up. You add up, uh, he did the sum, he uh, showed that in the limit the gamma goes to zero, if you do this math and add up all the different anomalies that might get you to the red outcome, and all the different anomalies that might get you to the green outcome, you get the Born rule. You get cosine squared of half, half the angle of rotation. Um, and now, this only works in the limit that gamma gets really, really tiny. You don't want it to quite go to zero and you get infinity. But, uh, so he just said, that would be really nice if this were the rule, because then out would come the Born rule, and you would get the right problem. <clears throat> okay, so here's, this is the model on base, the only model I'm going to need to explain entanglement. It's a one particle model, and all basically it says is when you measure it, um, you impose a final boundary condition, in this case either in the red direction or the green direction. There are lots of ways to get there, and you get, with that rule, you get the right probability distribution just about with some tiny gamma correction. So, uh, what does this mean in practice? Say Alice prepares a spin, spin up, uh, it's on the left, and she sends it to Bob on the right, and Bob measures some angle beta, um, and you plug it in and discover that uh, you get about the board rule. And the, it's a joint probability. It's not a conditional probability, because what you're looking at are the space of anomalies that are happening in the middle. And the beautiful thing about this is it's time symmetric, right? If I, if I reverse this and just ran it the other way, I would get exactly the same intermediate anomalies for exactly the same reason. It would be exactly the same distribution. It's a nice time symmetric story. You might say, ah, but it could just be a collapse story. Why don't you just have it stay up, 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 and have it collapse when it gets there with the probability rule? That's not a time symmetric story. Dynamic collapses are not time symmetric stories. Because now you run the other way, it's at an angle the whole time, and it collapses over here. The only way to have this time symmetric story is to use joint probabilities on the whole history and put, and put the anomalies in there. <clears throat> um, there is still time asymmetry here, but it comes in through the agents. Bob can't choose the outcome. Alice can choose a spin up on the way in. <laughs> But Bob can't choose whether he's going to get this outcome or this outcome. He's going to get he's one, of, one of two outcomes. He can't choose, choose the outcome. <clears throat> Again, the probabilities are not conditional. They're these nice natural joint probabilities on the whole history. And uh, they're governed by the Shulman's concepts. And the key point I want to point out here is even this seemingly not so bad model is retrocausal in exactly the right way. So we're going to need to save uh, entanglement in space time. Now, uh, you may not spot the retrocausality here, but uh, the retrocausality comes in because Bob has free setting on this angle. Right? Bob can, can rotate this however he wants. And if he chose a different angle, that would be a different future boundary condition, and it would change the probabilities that there would be anomalies in the past. You don't see the anomalies. They're hidden, right? So you're not signaling to the past, but it's causal. So let's say, take the example where Bob chose beta equals zero. Now, there's basically, over, you go through the math, there's overwhelming probability that you see it spin up, and basically zero probability of any anomalies. So basically, by choosing a different angle, Bob has caused more or less anomalies in the past. They're safely hidden by the fact that we can't 
measure where we don't measure. Um, but it's formally retrocausal. And this is exactly what we need to violate statistical independence. The hidden variables of what the state is doing in here depend on a future set. And again, as weird as that is, it's exactly what we need to save space. <clears throat> okay, let me try to come into that with a trivial extension to entanglement. Normally, you take a one particle model, you try to make a two particle model, and all hell breaks loose. It doesn't work. Here, you don't need to do anything. You just, Chalma didn't even realize this. Uh, you just take two of his particles and you just couple them together in exactly the way we, we might tell a high school student that a spin uh, zero a single state works. You say, well, the two particles decay from a spin zero state and they have to be opposite spins by conservation of momentum and uh, whatever this one is, this one is the opposite. But you don't know what they are. So that, that's not right, right. That's not the right story for a single state. It's more complicated than that. But suppose we just started with the, that trivial idea that all you do is these two particles have to be opposite spin. And then you apply Shulman's ensembles to both particles. We're going to get out the right answer here. This is the foreshadowing. You don't need to do anything else. You just do two of these particles. So this is how it works. So each particle could have an anomalous rotation, right? We're going to make a measurement on each particle. Alice on the left, Bob on the right. Uh, presumably, you might guess, that the, the odds that the initial uh, state is aligned with one of those measurement angles might be very slim. You can see that's not necessarily true. Um, so there might, you might imagine there's anomalous rotation here to red or green, and anomalous rotation here to red or green. And you just uh, look at, say, well, what's the probability of the whole history? These are already joint probabilities. These are already probabilities of history. So what is the probability of this whole history? And you just combine the probabilities in the usual way. You don't just change probability theory or go to negative probabilities and do, do anything weird here. <clears throat> Follows from this that histories where one of these two anomalies is zero becomes overwhelmingly probable. The reason is you just plug in Shulman's Anzos for this thing. Um, and you say, well, suppose both of them are non zero. Then they're both much bigger than gamma. Gamma is this tiny parameter. Then you get something that looks like this. But if one of them is basically zero or near near gamma, then or much smaller than gamma, better yet, the probability uh, now say alpha is really really small. The probability goes like this. And since alpha is so small, this is enormous. So the joint probability is much 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 bigger if if the initial two. Um, spin vectors, one of them is aligned with either theta 1 or theta 2. This clearly retro, it's not hard to see the retrocausality in the first one. This is clearly retrocausal. The free choice of external measurements here are basically constraining, as a two-time boundary problem, constraining what the initial spin orientation of these two particles are. <clears throat> um, and it's not only just like hand-waving. By the way, this could violate the building qualities. This violates them in the actual right way. Uh, it's pretty easy to see that if one, if one of the particles is aligned properly, the other one needs to rotate by whatever angle difference between these two settings. And you just plug in the math, and you get, say, the, there are four outcomes now. But the probability is that they're both aligned with the measurement setting is this. The probability is they're both anti-aligned is this. Uh, the probability is, I mean, both anti-aligned with both measurement settings. The pro probability that one is lying with one measurement setting, the other's opposite, is cosine squared. And you get exactly the observed joint probabilities that are so hard to explain in a space-time story. But now we're explicitly in a space-time story. We have an explicit local state here, explicit local state here, no, no configuration space needed, outcome, the right problem. Um, how does this work? How do you get around Bell's there? Well, it's, it's the retrocausality. We're violating statistical independence. The choice of future measurement has an impact on this possibility space or probability space of how these initial spins are oriented. Are oriented. Um, but it's not, it's not this free will loophole. This is a commonly conflated with retrocausality. The free will loophole is that the experimenter decision is also caused by the same thing. That's not at all what I'm talking about. The experimental decision is coming from outside the system of interest. I hardly have to talk about the experimenters at all. Those are free choices from outside the system. Uh, the, all the retrocausality is on the light lines of these, uh, or the, the world lines of these particles. 
So you might say, well, that's cute and all, but it's just a singlet state. Um, it's surely a far cry from all, of, all possible entangled states. Well, immediately from this, you can get any maxim, maximally entangled qubit state. And you can get from the singlet state any of them just by rotating, rotating one of the particles. So that, that's done. You've got every maximally entangled state, you have a space-time story. <clears throat> now, the hard part I've been working on for the last year or two are the partially entangled states. Um, there are a lot more partially entangled states than maximally entangled states, and so you need a large space of hidden variables to locally encode all the different possibilities. Um, and that now, that hidden variable model is now done. Um, you get exactly the right size space by going uh, to second order uh, equations, kind of like my fine Gordon guess. So basically, if you go from the Dirac equation to something called the, um, the Feynman Gilman equation, uh, that's like going from first order to second order, sometimes called second order fermions. And basically, this is the qubit analog to second order fermions. And if you do that, you double your space of possibility, you double your parameter space in just the right way to get uh, the hidden variable space we're going to need for, for partially entangled states. Better yet, uh, I've now mocked up an analog of a controlled knot gate. So basically, I can build quantum circuits now on these local states, uh, which is going to let us not only generate any partially entangled state, but free particle states, GHZ, and particle states. Any finite dimensional entangled state, uh, I now have a hidden variable model for. Um, and I just said that. Uh, the last step, which uh, I, I think will be done by the end of the year, is just to generalize this ONZOP to get the right, the right probabilities out. If I can do that, um, I kind of feel like that's the ballgame. I kind of feel like um, now any entangled state has a space-time representation. Whether anyone likes it or not is, I don't know, but you probably are going to like it because there's retrocausality. But it's there. It's on the table. And so that is the, uh, that's the exciting result I hope people will pay attention to if, if and when this last little bit uh, falls into place. <clears throat> um, where might this take us? Well, apparently there would be a classical field story if all this generalizes properly. Uh, not just restricted knowledge. It's not just that you don't know all the microscopic details of this hidden variable space, but it's also that you relax the dynamic equations and impose two, two time boundary conditions. But basically, if I'm right that there is some underlying story, in space-time and classical fields that could explain all this in some in some apparent limit, then you can imagine just do the same thing over here. I mean, it's it's easy to get from here to here on the classical side to couple all the classical fields in in the standard model Lagrangian with uh, with GR. Um, if the same procedure works, this would be a totally different path to quantum gravity. This hasn't worked very well, and the reason would be that, well, we didn't really understand this space, why this space worked well to begin with. It was just always a state of knowledge, not a state of reality. And so we've been trying to build quantum gravity out of states of knowledge, rather than out of space, states in space time. Uh, so I'm sure uh, there should be, and, and is a lot of skepticism all around, but I just want to, want to put, them on, put it on the table that space time is still an option. It's mm -hmm. not uh, as ruled out as you probably thought it was. Um, and the key is to put a future boundary condition on the system. Maybe it won't work this way, maybe it'll be something else, but it's almost certainly got to involve uh, a future boundary if you want to map these space time. You get this enormous reduction in the anthology from configuration space time to space time, and I see it as a small price because I like time to infinity. If you really want, if you don't want the future to be real, if you want a time asymmetric story at heart, maybe it seems like a large price. Um, I, I actually like time signature. Um, so why is the quantum wave function so big? Well, it's just because we're not Bayesian updating the paths. Um, basically, when we learn the future measurement setting, we don't update the path properly. Uh, because we figure, well, whatever setting is in the future, they can't possibly compile it. <coughs> if you do up update the path, uh, basically you can fit it, you can fit the ontology back in space-time as conditional on your future geometry that you're going to measure. The key, again, is this Lagrangian one-style approach, um, looking at not just one uh, classical equation, but lots of possible histories, and uh, hopefully I can generalize this for, her, for any entangled state. Um, even if, if this is all successful, it certainly does not mean space-time is not emergent. I mean, 
just because I think DR is more fundamental does not mean there might not be something more fundamental than that. But the nice thing about this result would, it would mean that such approaches like causal sets and uh, the earlier thing we heard from Kevin and company today uh, wouldn't have to explain the quantum phenomena. They would just have to get us up to space time. And then from space time, there would be this other emergent story that got us to quantum theory. So uh, I'm not saying that space time is the end all be all, but it should be back on the table as we're thinking about uh, quantum states. Thanks a lot. So the, the initial, uh, so there's a space possibility space, right? This way, this way, this way. We also have a big possibility space. How do you assign probabilities in that space? Well, we have this, this rule. It's, that's part of this whole history. It's, it's not just you assign, you don't assign the probability to the state. You assign the probability to the whole history in this story. That's the key. It all works, not slices. So you say, well, which histories have the bigger probabilities? So you look at this expression. You say, when is this big and when is it small? And it's really, really big when either alpha is zero, and you don't need any anomaly here, then this goes and blows up to one over gamma squared. Or when beta is zero, and this blows up to one over gamma squared. So you say, ah, therefore, when this universe solves this all once, it's not solving it like a computer here. We're solving this all once. It finds, ah, there's this huge space of solutions where alpha, where it's already aligned. I don't need any rotation at all. So it's, I mean, that's surprising because you would have thought, thinking about it in this way, I've got two boundary conditions and there should be a kind of symmetry. Uh, but now it seems like arbitrarily one gets back yeah. to the... Right, and which one is, is random? Uh, I've also done it, and if you read my papers with Hugh on this, we actually have, it's the net rotation. And it's actually one big net rotation rather than one rotation of zero and one rotation of the net. Um, you get the same result both ways. I'm a little torn on which way to go. This is clearly simpler. I don't have to uh, uh, bring in all the stuff that you and I are writing about as finding in the symmetry principle and stuff. Uh, I think this is simpler if you like the one part of the model. Just two, two, two one part of the model and you're done. Um, but you may be very well be right. And when I do the partial entanglement, it actually will look more like that. Well, there'll be one, one rotation between, between these. So I, I think I missed a point really okay. early on. Um, so just with one particle, if I want to compute the Green's function for a particle to be at a particular location in space at a particular time okay. with a particular value for its internal spin okay. to it being at a different point in space at a later time with a particular internal value for its spin, okay. I can compute the Green's function for that using the Dranchian principle, if you sure, like. Sure, sure. Right. I'm using, you know, the Dirac dynamics. Right, 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 right. So how is that any different? I, could, I mean, I can okay, do that as the a... Difference, the difference comes in exactly uh, this, is that when you do that, you usually consider all possible outcomes in some order. No, you don't. Well, okay, you consider one at a time. Because if the Green's function okay, is sure, to sure. something that right. you can observe. Okay, you're right. And then, they, but, and then you, and then so you get the right probabilities if you just look at the... You, you, you the right get here. exactly the right probabilities. That's right. And furthermore, you don't have to invent any weird uh, new dynamics. Sure, but you don't have the story of what's happening in between. Sure, you you do. It's all these paths, oh, wow. right? That's you're summing over all the paths. Uh, we're, looking, we're looking for a, a one, one real history story eventually. But you're right. And if you're not concerned about having a time symmetric ontology in here, you might as well just calculate uh, the S matrix. But it's and completely time symmetric. What do you mean it's not? It's perfectly time symmetric. Depending on how you interpret, well, uh, it's just not say a single. All possible paths happen. Uh, it doesn't that, that satisfy the boundary conditions? The, that satisfy the, the boundary conditions. Past and the future um, boundary conditions. Maybe, maybe there's a path forward. That's that's a salvageable intermediate ontology that will live in space time. But all possible paths to me sounds like in configuration space, in as a field function. So that's um, the point I'm missing. You're trying to reduce it to a single to, path. To a single history in a space time. A single history in space time. Okay. That's, that's, the, that's the key. Otherwise, you don't say space time. You're still back in configuration. 
it, you mean if you were to apply this to 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 a multi to yeah. a, <laughs> interpolating format? Sure. Right. To or to multi particles. You, the, the whole point is to say it's phase time. But but so do you get the same answer with this? Well, this? with this you do whether or not to this the generalizes. direct evolution. Hmm? To the direct evolution. Uh, this this is just a qubit. This is just a spin vector moving. It now has to get generalized to space. No no no, no 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 no. That's not I mean. In principle, although in practice it hasn't been done, you can do a Bell experiment with a pair of entangled electrons mm -hmm. and then make measurements on them. Mm -hmm. So the evolution of that is approximately a two-part of the yeah. Dirac equation. Um, so there are some specific dynamics there. Right. The question is, is this the same? Uh, I think it will map onto that, but like, like you said, it has nothing. I, I don't have it. I don't have the, the generalization that goes to three plus one dimensional space. I just have these. Well, no, that's what you can do it in one plus one. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that's the next best thing, just to actually have a one plus one field and, and actually do it on the field rather than do it on the vector. Um, that's a similar question. I'm just curious about the nature of this baseline story. Okay. So, so the history is important, but what is that history of? So if we're doing Bohmian mechanics, we have a history of particle positions, mm -hmm. and they'd be doing some kind of wild things, but I know exactly what it would be right. to have a history. Um, and sometimes you speak like we're dealing with a field theory here, sometimes it seems like we've got particle paths. So could you just give me a concrete example of what a history in space-time would look like? Um, say the, the four vector potential from E and M, A, uh, as a function of space and time. The actual values that they're filled space time. That's a history. So uh, a vector field. A vector, a vector field. Uh, um, uh, <coughs> the metric, uh, the actual metric is the history. Yeah. Those could all be histories. These are s much, much simpler. These are just just vectors moving through time, really. I don't even have space here. Yeah. But um, yeah, those would all be histories. One real history. And that's what you expect to get. I right. The, yeah. If, if constrained by a future boundary, uh, there's hope to get all this entanglement. Right. I was just puzzled by, I mean, what it means to save space time on your view. So, um, do we need to save space time in classical statistical mechanics? And if, no. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's okay, so clear. There's a really clear underlying story there. So it's, it's because density. of locality and entanglement that we need to save space right, time in right. and it's because quantum states, the only description people have of multi-particle quantum states, doesn't have a space-time representation. Um, and because of that... Uh, so quantum field theory doesn't live in space-time in your sense? Because of well, it's, it's, it's the analog to configuration space for field theory is now field functional. So you have this functional of all possible fields <laughs> um, rather than one. Um, but you don't want to say you know quantum field is an operator by the distribution over space time. That doesn't I, I, because that doesn't of failures of local, locality and entanglement. Uh, that's really the right. Yeah, because okay. I mean eventually you have to get down to things like how do you explain single measurements on a single state uh, in a space time picture? And there either is one or there isn't. And uh, well, uh, Oliver and I were debating a bunch whether or not. Uh, Hebridean, uh, whether Wallace and Kinson have a space time story. Uh, and and uh, we can talk more about that. But, um, this, this is the sort of space time story I would. Something I can say, at the end of the day, I can say one history happened. And maybe I don't know, then stat you never know which history happened. I, I'd be fine with that, as long as one of them happened. Can I explain that? Where is space in this picture? Well, I, I have I just got a vector in time. This is zero plus one so far. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, what would be the configuration space of your hidden variable theory that produces space time or that refers to a dynamical space time, your quantum gravity theory? Um so the So you seem to the, make a the general fundamental point. thing would be classical GR with classical fields. And then and then you say, well, wait, I don't know what final boundary it's going to encounter. 
So you build this configuration space of all these possible feature measurements. So now this is an epistemic state, not a real state. You build this epistemic state in your head, taking into account all possible measurements, so you're ready for whatever measurement you make, you can make a prediction. Um, now that, does, that doesn't correspond to reality. Then, when you actually choose the measurement, or the future geometry of the universe, then you should update, throw away all the, geom all the configuration space that never gets used, and only gets collapsed away, and just use, use the final boundary that is actually happening, and then you now have a space-time description, again. But you don't have one in that intermediate step, because you don't, you don't know the boundary. So suppose I were to um, uh, put a TN in between the, the TI and the okay. TN. Okay, good, good. Um, it doesn't right. look to me as if this is going to be um, multiplicative in the right way. Um, okay, so for uh, a strong measurement, uh, you can show that it will work uh, once you uh, condition on everything properly. For, I don't have the weak measurement story yet. So that's the interesting thing that they can do with this two-state vector probability. Is they can put in a weak measurement and get these weak values out and you can see them out. And I, I need to generalize this to weak values. But it's not clear ultimately um, that I haven't gone anywhere or trying to show that this would work for weak measurement. But for strong measurement, 